Hello and welcome to this overview of illicit discharge detection and elimination. We're going to talk about what it is, how to work with it in the MS4 permit, and how to access resources from folks like me at VLAMO. My name is Nick Voss. I'm Education and Outreach Coordinator here at the Vadnas Lake Area Water Management Organization. This presentation can also be used as a training resource for either on the ground inspection and enforcement staff or for communications and administration. I recommend bringing in a variety of staff from different roles and positions to really streamline your program, make it more effective and connected in the long run, and it really fills out the different needs and nuances that we're going to talk about here in this presentation. So let's start with the basics. Why detect or why bother at all? Well, it's one of the six minimum control measures in the MS4 permit. So auditors from the MPCA will be looking for the procedures and the documentation at the end of a permit cycle. It's a way to prevent long-term persistent and costly issues for infrastructure and water alike. It might not be convenient, it's definitely easier to look the other way, but these are the types of issues that add up to a bigger problem with neglect. Storm drains are lakefront property. We really try to emphasize this connection between the street and the ditch, or streets and streams, wetlands or lakes. There's no treatment underground in that mystery unseen zone, so uh, the more that we can raise awareness that what we do on the street level impacts downstream, the better. The picture on the upper right is a rare case where there's a hero on call, but in most cases, we are the hero. We're on site, we're responding, we're cleaning up spills, and we're the ones to save someone downstream from paying or save the community from a long-term impact on drinking water or recreation. So we are the detective. You are that detective. It can be a really thankless job sometimes and that goes for anyone who does snow plowing or streets maintenance or inspections. But we in the water field applaud you. We really thank you for what you do and it's no understatement that you really are the heroes of a community. Okay and here is a quick look at our outline. We're going to start with acquiring our super advanced technical IDDE goggles to get that lens for how to see it. Solutions and best practices. We'll have examples of response and enforcement. Some talking points on pollution infrastructure and screen infrastructure. Sometimes the Interactions with the public are on the fly or unpredictable, so uh, we're going to build a bit of a foundation for you to draw from and where to go for support. To put on our illicit discharge goggles, let's start with a look at the definition from the EPA. Federal regulations define an illicit discharge as any discharge to an MS4 that is not composed entirely of stormwater, with some exceptions. Stormwater also includes snow and ice melt water. I'll go over the exceptions a little later, but first we just got to realize that you know, this is a broad definition and um, it could include lots of different substances and the reality is you don't have all day to focus on this one topic. That is why we need this pair of goggles, so to speak. Uh, to help prioritize and really detect what needs correction, uh, remediation, and um, how to really give a structure to this big issue. First thing we should watch for are the things that seem innocent or they seem natural because it's just sediment or grass clippings, yard waste. Uh, that all breaks down, right? These things actually have negative consequences they smother habitat and create soil disturbances, which perpetuates the cycles of invasive species. They bring an influx of nutrients into wetlands, lakes, and streams. Um, excess nutrients is actually a pollutant. And it's also something that clogs infrastructure and creates 
costly dredging or cleaning needs later on. If it looks like a pile of grass clippings, a pile of leaf litter, cloudy water that can be tracked upstream. And in the big picture, something like grass clippings on the street is just so common that it's not practical to address case by case, but that can also be addressed through education efforts. But why does it happen? Most of the time people don't realize the connection between the street and the water body, so they just don't know. Sometimes it is intentional dumping, something like a mattress or um, appliances that they're just getting rid of and they want it out of sight. It can also come from construction site runoff, dumping concrete wash water, whether or not someone knows that that is harmful, or accidental septic tank effluent. And then we get to the things that are pretty obvious that they don't belong anywhere near a drain or a water body. Chemicals, stain, paint, oil, grease, sewage, or cleaning products. This is where you watch for suds. It can also be cloudy water from cleaning products, likely gray or white. Watch for that rainbow coloring on the street that might indicate a oil spill. And something like grease will stain pavement, giving it a wet appearance when it hasn't rained. Sometimes you'll see a character like Uncle Eddie on the lower right, but it's usually more elusive and you rarely spot the dumping in action. But again, why? Leaks or in the very unfortunate case of an auto accident, uh, oil or antifreeze can get onto the road. Leftover products or household hazardous waste. The picture on the left I took myself and it's a pretty easy indicator of something being dumped that should not have been. Especially when the drain had a stamp for dump no waste. It can be sad and really disheartening sometimes. Soap suds and detergents come from mop buckets, especially behind shopping centers. Large-scale power washing is another common source of illicit discharge. A few more sources. Illicit discharge can also occur in the winter with excessive road salt. It can be water softener salt that's dumped into a drain or ditch. I discovered that case on the lower left and took that photo. It can be carpet cleaning or similar wash water. Like I mentioned with grease, it can be dumped, it stains pavement, and that can also come from improper storage or a leaky storage container. Car wash, laundry waste water, and road waste spills. Debris and litter comes in all shapes and sizes. Of course, it's never fun to clean up, but it can help to have a strong communication education program around something like the annual cleanup day. Pathogens is when we have to look at our four-legged fur babies and realize they can contribute to some nasty pollutants themselves. Pet waste is one of those small and sneaky infringements, but it is specified in the MS4 permit that there needs to be steps and communication around the issue of pet waste. But sight is just one part of the equation. Sometimes smell is all you've got. It could also be the case where you smell it before you see it. It includes something musty, sewage, rotten eggs. Does it smell like gas or oil? Is it sharp or pungent? Rancid or sour? Does it smell like a pool? Or is it sweet and fruity? Which might seem pleasant, but it would indicate a chemical. But of course, the permit does not expect you to put yourself in harm's way or expose your something to a legitimate health hazard. If it's clear that it's some nasty stuff, it's probably time to call a specialist with advanced equipment. I briefly mentioned construction, and this is a whole topic with certifications and trainings that are definitely worth checking out. But this will be just a little glimpse into the world of construction best management practices, or BMPs. When you're near a construction site, it's easy to ask, is there a BMP absent or is it poorly installed? Once you know what to look for. There's the inlet protection. There's rock exits 
that will catch sediment off of tires and equipment. There's coir logs that are intended to lay across a slope. Silt fences that are intended to be the perimeter around the construction site and also used to trap larger amounts of sediment and erosion control blankets to cover exposed soil. And without getting too deep into the detail, it really comes down to pausing to ask, is this BMP serving a purpose? Is it the purpose that it was intended for? One of the most common infringements is a coir log being used where a silt fence should be. Coir logs are cheaper and they're easy to just lay down and it looks like something is there and it might look official uh, because there's so much activity on the construction site. The coir log does not trap and contain sediment like a silt fence does. So that may need to be switched out. Another common one is inlet protection at a storm drain inlet. I discovered this example on the top where it looks like a pool noodle is just thrown right on the drain and that might look significant but if you just take a moment to think about what the bottom of the drain is going to experience, all of that sediment, uh, loose debris is going to wash right into the bottom of that drain and that pool noodle is probably even going to wash away. So, oh my goodness, when you see it, you cannot unsee it. Proper protection would look like the back and the base of the drain being covered. And when these actually trap sediment and pile it up outside of the drain, that sediment has to be removed when the protection is removed. Otherwise, it's just concentrated and left alone to wash into the drain. Lastly, neglected setup cleanup can be pretty easy to spot if you keep the big picture in mind what's the goal of a construction site BMP. We're trying to contain all the sediment on site during the construction process. So on the bottom, you see a silt fence that somehow just stopped before the end of the construction site. There's all that loose soil that is free to drain off site and we see water going down the road. So that would be a case of communicating with the contractor or landowner to bring it up to par. Construction projects have their own reporting mechanism called a SWIP, which is a Storm Water Pollution Prevention Plan. Construction SWIP reports are a way for the city or an engineering department or an inspections department to communicate with, check on, and request changes to the construction process. Okay, now is a great time to take a break, pause the video, take a walk, go somewhere pretty like this. This has been the extent of the detection and the IDDE goggles portion. The next part is going to talk about the planning and the processes behind the scenes. So, I'll be back in a little bit. Welcome back to this next part. We're going to look at the planning and the technical components of the permit, uh, some talking points and education approaches. And this all starts with knowing your system, knowing what you've got, as well as the gaps. I know the gaps are overwhelming, or it could seem like that's going to be a huge perpetual task that will always um, be creating more work to do. But in the long run, I offer this encouragement that it'll be easier overall. It's possible to get to that point where things just ding, click and function and work coherently. So this includes public reporting, the public being able to contact and submit a report, allocated roles across the staff, cleanup procedures for what to do when things go awry, documentation, how does everything get written down in the process of a cleanup, and knowing the lay of the land. The stormwater system includes the intakes, the discharge areas, where water flows during dry weather, because that's going to be different from right after a rain event, and it's going to mean different things. Lastly, what are the connecting water bodies? So, as we go through this section, 
Keep in mind, no two illicit discharge detection systems look alike. The MS-4 permit invites you to adapt and fine-tune this to your community. So it can look different ways. You can morph it and modify it uh, as long as it's meeting these core requirements. Once you've got a good grasp on the plan and the process itself across the team, it's easier to know where to look. Obviously this doesn't happen overnight, but with some attention and awareness as you move around town, these things will become familiar and uh, something that people can talk about and ask about and uh, sort of build that familiarity. Examples include loading docks, outdoor storage areas, construction sites, dumpsters behind buildings, um, such as shopping centers, alleyways and parking lots. So you get to know the activity and drainage hotspots. Where does water move more and where does that water movement meet development or a shopping center and, and where these things intersect. The picture on the right is almost to the point of being an illicit discharge. Notice that the border is just the coir log and not a silt fence. So this was after a rain event, coir log placed down haphazardly as a shortcut and what happens the large amount of sediment in the stockpile drains down, runs over the coir log. We've been talking about pollution most of this time, but there are some exceptions. Things that may run off into storm drains that are not exactly rainwater, but they're not illicit discharge. So these include clean water discharges such as water line flushing when sprinklers get flushed out in September, air conditioning condensation, sump pump discharge or irrigation water if it does not smell like fertilizer from a recent fertilizer application, public safety discharge such as fire hydrants, of course rainfall, snow melt, and dechlorinated swimming pool water. There's a process for discharging pool and hot tub water, so that has to sit for three to four days stagnant uh, so that it becomes dechlorinated. Once that happens, it should be discharged across vegetation such as turf, preferably higher standing vegetation, before it reaches a storm drain or ditch. So be sure not to skip that step or Frankly, you're making bad decisions. Wah wah. Right now, you're ready for a deeper dive into the requirements. Now, this is the full overview of what Minimum Control Measure 3 calls for on the MS-4 permit. This is taken right from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in their permit guidance documents. So, like we've talked about, we have the regulatory mechanisms. Prohibit general illicit discharge and report when it happens. Have a way to have the public report it. That includes pet waste and salt storage, especially for municipalities. Illicit discharge incorporated into all municipal operation inspection and maintenance. So best case scenario, it's just part of the flow, the day-to-day -day experience. Detecting and tracking, that's where those maps come in. Recognition training for field staff. So this is not just the public works folks or not even just the water folks. This is also a public safety topic. So police, fire, after all we're dealing with flammable materials and things that are a safety hazard or a public health hazard. Identify those priority areas, that's where most of the infringements are going to occur. Procedures for investigating, locating, and eliminating. Again, design those with your team and your needs in mind. Enforcement response procedures. Who to call, and I'll look at that in the next few slides. Lastly, documentation. That's going to come into play at the end of the MS-4 permit cycle, which is every five years. Now let's get into storage. 
It's pretty common sense that proper storage and good habits will reduce the risk of spills to begin with. So that's the goal here. First, we check storage containers and dumpsters for leaks. It's part of that ongoing routine we mentioned. Close and lock dumpster enclosures. Um, keep them off limits and accessible for um, that midnight dumping or, or those kinds of things. Store hazardous materials on pallets indoors, like the picture on the right. Always err on sweeping before going to a hose. Uh, hosing down a surface is going to disperse things, it's just going to wash away, it's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, habits to sweep are going to contain and um, clean surfaces that way. Um, have a spill cleanup kit, such as absorbents, like this picture on the bottom. Have that ready with location and the use known. Everybody's just got to know where it is and, and it's got to be convenient to access. So an absorbent that cleans up a spill has to be contained, labeled, date of the spill, and the disposal according to what that substance is. Here's one more about storage and the procedures around storage. This actually also relates to the minimum control measure number six in the MS4 permit. Number six is actually good housekeeping. So just as it sounds, keeping things tidy is going to be a asset for um, keeping things clean and preventing illicit discharge. First one is to label all containers and mixing and application devices. The date of use, the intended use, and the intended storage location. That could be something like top shelf or a yellow cabinet or any number or letter coding that you develop. Store away from high traffic areas. Use the material safety data sheets uh, such as that graphic on the bottom. Organize according to the hazard labels or those the number system of what a substance is and use that inventory for decision making, for clearing out outdated products, reducing the accumulation of hazardous materials um, so that you've just got less clutter and um, an easier time finding what you want, keeping things moving. It's just a, a good practice to have in general. And similarly, perhaps you can relate with this more everyday example. So what can we do to make the whole process work? Well, it's really about pulling together the resources that are at your disposal. Um, here in our watershed, we have a great resource with the Ramsey County A to Z Disposal Guide. Having that be familiar, having everyone on staff look at it and be familiar with how it's laid out before the need arises is a big way to develop a best practice. Similarly with the smart salting topic, maintaining the training across different roles and responsibilities so that everybody's on the same page with the smart salting lingo, the strategies, and the philosophy. And that's a great way to give it traction and make progress. Next up is the response plan. This is an example from the city of Cloquet. I don't need to go down the list or read everything word for word, but you can really see the basics and the layout with um, how many things are brought in to create a concise resource. We have the illicit discharge sources on the left, and then you have a responding entity designated for each one. Sorry if it's a little hard to read, but some of the things that we see in the responding entities could be Public Works Department, After Hours Emergency, 911, it could be Community Development, Fire Department, or it could refer to another table that you'll have in your documents. That's probably when you get into contractors or subcontractors for specialty remediation. Remember that the MS4 permit itself is your guide. So 
directly from the 2020 to 2025 permit, part 18.12 lists the written procedures in a response plan. So that's a time frame, method of visual inspections, what tools you're using, the cleanup methods that you have in your wheelhouse, and names, position titles of responsible persons. This is the last slide for the response plan. This is an example from the city of Elk River. It does a nice job of laying out the flow of what happens right after a spill. From the top to bottom, we have stop the source, contain, prevent the spill from entering a waterway, isolate the spill area. Then we have reporting. Report clean up all spills. When it comes to cleanup, there's decisions to make. So is it a small localized spill or a large spill? And you can keep going down to use a chart like this as your guide. This is from the MS4 toolkit on the MPCA website. Once all these pieces are in place, the inspection itself is actually pretty straightforward. They should include protective gloves, goggles, placing traffic cones and using flashers, and traffic control as needed, and it could require confined space training. It may be smart to also include some kind of mask. It's pretty rare that something would be so potent to require a breathing apparatus of some sort. Um, you really don't need to stick your face in it or get real close. Uh, you're just inspecting um, to the degree that you're able to determine the basics of what it is and if it's an issue. Once you know the basics, you can adapt as you need to. Maybe it's a shovel or a loader or a piece of equipment to remove the substance on the spots. Next up is enforcement. This is the spectrum of enforcement actions that the permit wants you to have available and you're going to be the one to deploy them. It starts with a verbal warning and works its way up into warnings, written warnings, stop work orders if that's relevant, a written citation, contractor cleanup and bill to the owner, or legal action. Something like a citation and up to legal action is going to be important to have as a city ordinance and there's also examples of those in the MS4 toolkit. Next is the piece that brings it together as a community effort. So that includes brochures, signage, or templates about topics like yard waste and composting. Here at Vlamo we develop templates and materials that our MS4 partners can directly use or make a few tweaks fine-tune the language, and make it fit your needs. That's okay too. Education gets easier when there's a clear reporting process. How the public can be on the same wavelength, have some basics on what to look for and who to call. It really helps to lead by example, encourage people to use the reporting process, use the materials that are available so that they don't get forgotten or neglected in a file somewhere. So at this point you might be doing one of these and thinking maybe I won't have to do the education piece. But remember you are not alone. There's so many organizations doing the same thing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you don't have to be a communications or education specialist. That's okay. But what the permit's trying to do is cultivate an active, ongoing communication effort. So going back to the permit here in part 16, it calls for at least once each calendar year to distribute educational materials or outreach focused on illicit discharge recognition reporting. There's another piece on here for impacts of de-icing salt on receiving waters, methods of reducing de-icing salt, and proper storage of salt. But look into the permit further. These aren't the only pieces relating to education. 
I wanted to pull this one for a glimpse at what the pieces are. All in all, something that is simple and ongoing is going to perform a lot better and create a sense of cooperation around the topic. It also makes it more likely that another group, like a scout troop or community organization, might take that message and further develop it. That's a win for you, it's a win for the permit, because the permit always invites collaboration, and it'll give the program more of a local touch, more of a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. I've mentioned documentation a few times. This one's really quite simple once you have a reliable form that your team buys into. This might be a little tough to read, but this sample is taken right from the MS4 toolkit. It asks for the type of report, date of discharge, date of report, location, outfall, surface water, etc., description, source of discharge if you know it, follow-up action, follow-up action date, and the result of the follow-up action. Last slide for tracking and reporting. A successful report includes listing the street or the cross street, the intersection, cardinal directions, say the north or the south, what have you, date, time, was it repeated or sing singular, material description, color, type, odor, a photo if possible, license plate numbers, address, company name, any other descriptive information. Again, this goes for a storm drain or a ditch. And please remind the public, this can be anonymous. Culturally, I know it's much more common to mind your own business, but if nobody reports and illicit discharge happens, that impacts the water and that impacts real people downstream. It impacts the budget and the workload. All these things that really tie together. And this brings us to the last section of the entire training, some basic talking points that you can use in your calls with the public or newsletters or social media or however you want to blend them together. That brings us to the last section of this entire training, some talking points that provide some basics on some terms and some easy ways to convey what we've been working with to the public. First one is pollution, but the way we're talking about pollution is that this includes chemicals plus natural debris in excess. That means leaves or grass clippings, things that seem natural might be overlooked to the public. We're also thinking about specific contamination sites plus many small harms adding up. So when there isn't a definite spot that you can look at and say there's where the pollution's coming from, there's many little ones that you may never see and they add together. This is called non-point source pollution. Stormwater comes down to the idea that everyone has waterfront property. And waterfront property is something we understand. It's something you would want to take care of. The next one is infrastructure or stormwater infrastructure, if you like. It is regulated by the MS4 program, which has state and federal levels. The MS4 is a permit and a guide that helps protect the longevity of infrastructure and water resources. Then there's green infrastructure. This seeks to slow down and soak in stormwater runoff closer to where it lands or where it falls from the sky. It is more costly and burdensome on a community to leave runoff and sedimentation for the downstream tail end. And I invite you to think about what are the needs and talking points of your municipality. Are there major wetlands or floodplains that you work with? Is there a health and recreation risk, perhaps a key swimming beach? One of these talking points likely can build off of a pre-existing topic or issue regarding a certain area. A good way to say it is it's very expensive to dredge, to transport potentially toxic substances, and dispose of those substances. 
It's a lot more cost effective to prevent them on the front end than it is to do it on the tail end. I invite you to try this out. Take one of these talking points and treat it like an elevator speech. If you go through the rough draft and let it feel awkward, it's going to be a lot smoother and easier and you're going to think of it more readily in a moment of need. Don't forget there's people here to support you in this work. MPCA stormwater division, local watershed staff such as myself, or an engineering department or contracted firms at your municipality. Someone who focuses on this topic, with water resources or the MS4 program, is probably going to be excited to talk to you about it and help you along. The last key phrase I have for you is only rain down the drain. Simple, it's catchy. I know we did say there's some exceptions, some ways that runoff that's not rain is still not illicit discharge, but for practical purposes this works and it conveys the big picture of what we're trying to accomplish. I hope this was as enjoyable to watch as it was to put together and record. Thank you again for watching and all the best in your MS4 endeavors.